719. And now, here's your host, Kevin Conover. Bring your time. Welcome to Educate for Life Radio and Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. My website's educateforlife.org. And if you are concerned about your children having a strong faith, or maybe you yourself having a strong faith, you can check out my website, educateforlife.org. It's all about helping you to know why the Bible is true and being, being able to communicate that effectively to those around you, relatives, friends, conversations you have at, at Thanksgiving or whatever is uh, happening. We've got, we're coming up on the holidays, all kinds of opportunities to have these discussions about uh, eternal matters, things that are significant. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What's my purpose? All that good stuff. So you can check that out on my website, and I uh, would love to have you um, uh, become a member on our site. My uh, guest today is Dr. John Yo. He serves at Southern California Seminary as the professor of Old Testament. Prior to coming to SCS, SoCalSem.edu, um, Dr. Yo was assistant professor of Old Testament and academic dean, dean at Reformed Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia, and associate professor of Old Testament at South, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. He's also a member of the Evangelical Theological Society and the Society of Biblical Literature. And uh, just to brag on him a little bit more here, He's got a Ph.D. from the University of St. Michael's College. He's got a THM from Fuller Theological Seminary, an M.A. from Westminster Seminary, uh, California. So uh, he, he's got a, a good background here to give us some insight on a very, very important, what I think is a critically important subject today uh, that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Dr. Yo, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me on. Kevin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, this is your um, first time being on the radio, you told me. Yes, it is. Uh, okay, so so uh, very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm really glad you could be here. Um, so Dr. Yo, you know, when I'm talking to people about different questions about the Bible and everything, one of the things that pops up all the time is people will say to me, they'll say, um, you know, different people interpret the Bible differently. So how can you say that your opinion is any better than anybody else's opinion? And... Uh, and so there's this idea out there that pretty much people can make the Bible say whatever they want it to say, and so nobody's got a, a um, you know, uh, nobody's got the authority on truth or how you're supposed to interpret the Bible, and yet uh, the Bible is so important. How can we just let this go, you know? And so I wanted to talk to you about that today. Um, and so um, why don't we start? Why don't we go back in time to your upbringing and then your your uh, travels? For those of you listening, Dr. Yo, um, he has changed his position over time about how you interpret the scriptures, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, because really, the fundamental differences in doctrine that we hear all around us have to do with the method of interpretation. That is, how do you, how are you supposed to read the Bible? Uh, would you agree with that, Dr. Yo? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So... So tell us about your upbringing. What did you grow up in a Christian family? What what was it like? I did. My my father was a uh, a pastor. Very unique situation. He was a Presbyterian minister uh, as a missionary in a Baptist church. Now that's really really <laughs> unusual. So the the uh, the oversight board di didn't really. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, I guess long story short, um, I was kind of raised a Baptist, so to speak. I was actually baptized by full immersion, uh, and then my dad kind of had this reawakening of his Reformed tradition where, when he went to Germany. And so he did the whole Luther tour and things like that, and he came back really you know, fervent about the Reformed faith. And so there was a call uh, from a church in California, which he then took up, and so he joined the Christian Reformed Church, and that's where I really started to get introduced to Reformed theology. Okay, now I want to, um, for our listeners, because this is pretty intense stuff, the, the stuff we're talking about. So typically when people think of the Reformation, right? Right. They think of Martin Luther and everybody thinks, hey, this is a great thing, right? Because this was when uh, we got back to the Bible and we started sure. really. So can you help our listeners understand when you talked about, when you talk about your father and reformed theology or his reformed roots, right. how is that different from say, the Baptists, Southern Baptists. Right. Uh, great question. Um, I mean, the reformers were very important because of what was going on in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. And so with all the, the traditions, especially somebody, for example, like 
like John Tetzel selling indulgences uh, across the river from Luther's church. Yeah. Uh, where people were getting drunk, and yet, you know, <laughs> uh, Luther would say, well, why do you think that's right? And then he says, well, I bought an indulgence. And yeah. So uh, this really angered him. And so he, he hung up the famous 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg Church. Mm -hmm. And so he began what is known as the Reformation. And uh, that was a great thing. That was a wonderful coming back, like you said, to, to the Bible, back to the sources of our faith. Um, but along with that, I mean, you know, then came John Calvin and, and some of the other formers, uh, John Knox. Uh, and then it was kind of, um, you know, codified in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And so all of these other, you know, the Heidelberg Catechism, the three forms of unity. So all these other Reformed confessions. And what that seemed to do was kind of make uh, Reformed theology, uh, it kind of, I mean, it's understandable, but it kind of fossilized the theology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this is where Calvinism uh, comes forward, like, you know, the whole controversy with with Jacob or James Arminius yes yeah and, and the remonstrance yes and uh, and and you know this is where the two, battle over uh pre you know uh, the the five points correct. of Calvin pre, whether we have the freedom to choose or we don't correct and, yes. this, and this is where we get tulip you know total depravity yes unconditional election limited atonement irresistible grace perseverance of the, the five points of Calvinism right now um, along those same lines um so when you say that it became fossilized are you saying that essentially they were making uh, confessions that were, in a sense, extra biblical, fossilized versus going back to the Bible again. I think so. I mean, and you see this especially with um, with baptism, with with infant baptism. Yeah, and uh, that was something that was continued on from the Roman Catholic Church. And the irony is that part of the solas of the uh, well, it wasn't really a sola, but it was kind of like a a slogan of the Reformation yeah. was uh, Semper Reformanda, which was always reforming. Uh, and yet, I think for certain things, uh, they really didn't, you know, look at Scripture very carefully with regard to baptism. And so, you know, I mean, you know, seriously, can you can you say that baptism is explicitly taught? You know, I, I mean, infant baptism. Infant baptism, infant yeah. Baptism. yeah. Of course, believers' baptism is. But, um, you know, and I think this is where... Uh, my biblical theology started to butt heads with my systematic theology as, mm -hmm. a, as a reformed uh, theologian. And so um, things started to rapidly change in, in my hermeneutic. Yeah. And so this was part of uh, you know, my development in terms of my theology. Yeah. Uh, so so um, I want to go back to that real quick. Um, when you said again that they did the, the reformation happened it was kind of this back to the bible but it was almost like they didn't finish the job it was almost like um they they continued to hold on to some of the things the the remnants of some things that were taught in catholicism right. which were extra biblical they weren't things that were explicitly taught in the scriptures correct and so what happened was they almost repeated the same mistakes that the catholic church had made in, in that process and i think this is this is kind of true with every movement of God, mm. um, is that subsequent generations, for some reason, uh, they don't continue what their founders did. And so they just kind of um, pull back, and they get comfortable, and everything starts to fossilize. Everything mm. starts to... Uh, and, and I think these, these are where denominations uh, appear. Yeah. And, and then you get these, you know, these battles between denominations and doctrinal. Yeah. You know. Or the group that pops up and says, we're no denomination. Right? Yes, Calvary yes. Chapel, right? <laughs> Non-denominational. Yeah. Right, right. We just follow the Bible. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, I think Calvary Chapel is their own denomination. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, they seem like it. Uh, but it um, seems like it's human nature to kind of get into a rut and kind of go, these are the, these are the um, doctrines and traditions we've settled on. Right. And we're done exploring scripture on this issue. We're just going to continue to, Right. Stay in that rut. And don't get me wrong, I love the Cabaret Chapels. Yeah. But it, it just seems like they, they claim that they're not denomination, yet uh, you have to be in their Bible college. I mean, it's, it's kind of like you have to be within their church. System. Yes. Yeah. And that's kind of denominational. That's, sure. That's all I'm saying. Yes, I understand what you're saying. Uh, okay, so this is really interesting. So um, I'm really curious to know because a lot of people, you know, their, their whole life, they're consistently 
holding to one particular view, but you had a pretty massive transformation where you completely yeah. switched from looking at this through that reformed theology uh, and to the other. And so my guest today is Dr. John Yo, and he serves at Southern California Seminary. He's a professor of Old Testament. And we're talking about uh, essentially reformed theology and the consequences of that theology and um, the difference. So we're going to touch on things like dispensationalism uh, and uh, covenant theology and Israel and the church, amillennialism, premillennialism, um, all these different things that are impacted by our approach to interpreting scripture. So stay with us. We're going to be right back. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teachings. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. If you need to buy an affordable, reliable used car, truck, or even an enclosed trailer, call Conover Tires Wheels and Service in Oceanside. For tires and car repairs you can trust, call Dan Conover and his team at 760-439-1631. Honesty, integrity, and quality service. They're ASC, BBB, and NAPA certified. And they're proud supporters of Educate for Life. Learn more at ConoverTires.com. Check out their great reviews, 760-439-1631. How can you live in San Diego and miss out on enjoying the water? Fast Lane Kayaking sells popular Hobie Cat kayaks that you pedal, not paddle. That means your hands are left free for fishing and fun. They're light and they're easy to use and maintain. Just rinse them off. Try one free on a demo ride. For 36 years, Ron and Debbie Lane have served San Diego with fun, family-friendly water sports of all kinds. Learn more. FastLaneSailing.com. 619-222-0766. Hey, thanks for listening today. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. My website's educateforlife.org. Please check it out. It's got all kinds of awesome classes on there. We just finished... Uh, just a couple weeks ago, the very last class, 40 classes, all on helping you understand the truth of God's word. We cover everything you can imagine from creation and evolution to world religions to how do we know the Bible is actually God's word? How do they put the Bible together? How do we know it hasn't been changed? We deal with things like homosexuality and abortion, all the different stuff that you have questions about or you want to learn about in order to be able to have good discussions with those around you. And you know, um, October 13th, I'm speaking up at Calvary Chapel Oceanside. And I'm actually speaking specifically on the age of the earth, which is a controversial issue in the church today. Um, you have progressive day creation and things like that. And this is actually relates to what I'm talking with Dr. John Yo about today. Uh, you, it's hard to connect the dots if you don't study this sort of thing. But frequently you'll, you'll hear people say, well, how do you know that your view of the Bible is right? How do you know you're interpreting the Bible right, correctly? And this is why it's so important to understand what is the proper method of interpreting the Bible so that I come to the right conclusions because we know people have come to the wrong conclusions in the past and we don't want to make those mistakes either. So my guest today, Dr. John Yo, is an expert on this and he has a personal testimony about how he adjusted his perspective on how you interpret scripture. And uh, Dr. Yo, I wanted to ask you if you could kind of take us back to the moment where you began to realize you were shifting your thought process uh, about how to interpret scripture. What what was happening there? Right. So kind of to pick up where we left off, um, when I I did attend Biola University and then I, I took some classes at Talbot, but my dad, because he had this reformational uh, renewal, so to speak, uh, he encouraged me to, to attend Westminster Seminary in California. Uh, and he was good friends with uh, Dr. Robert Godfrey, who was president there at the time. And so they were going to offer me a scholarship, uh, you know, CRC was, and I said, okay, great, let's do it. So while I was there, 
it was there that I became reformed. So they started chipping away uh, at my theology and... Now this uh, is very interesting. So Westminster, um, I thought they were very conservative, but they, they are. had, they are, they, they are. So real quick for our listeners, the two main differences in the main ways you inter when you when you re refer to reformed right this is a is this a less literal method of interpretation versus a literal what are the main differences between reformed and and um uh what would you call it dispensational well, they, <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah i mean reformed theologians wouldn't say that it would necessarily be a less literal yeah. because they would even uh counter and say what is a literal interpretation of the bible mm. Because what they would say is, you, you have to look at the scriptures from their genre. Yes. And, and so we would agree with that, of course. Yes. But it's, it's then, how do you understand uh, the Old Testament in terms of how it was put together? Like, what's the, the theological structure of the Old Testament? And they would say that it's structured by covenants. Mm. And so, uh, I mean, obviously, the covenants are part and parcel of the Old Testament story. Sure. Uh, but then... They look at it as, as at a, through a theological lens. So they would say that Adam, for example, was under a covenant of works. And after he fell, then um, something called a covenant of grace uh, kicked in, where now God was going to deal with humanity through this covenant of grace, mm -hmm. beginning with the Abrahamic covenant, and then uh, the new covenant uh, with Christ would also be a part of that. And so it's called covenant theology. Yes. And um, and this so reformed theology is covenant theology. Correct. Yeah. And it's all based on this idea of covenant of works in Adam, where he fell and he plunged all of humanity into sin, and then you had Jesus come uh, and, and do a covenant of works, where he then redeems the fallen. He he redeems the elect. Uh, and then, but what about the covenant with Abraham and the co covenant with? the Hebrews and, and these sorts of things. And so the, for example, like the Mosaic covenant or the Sinaitic covenant would be another covenant of works. And so in these works covenants, you see uh, God giving them a law. In, in, for Adam in the garden, it was, you know, don't eat from this tree in the middle of the garden, the tree yeah. of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So uh, the covenant of works says, do this and you will live. Don't do this and you will die. And so we saw that in Eden where... Uh, you know, Adam and Eve disobey, they get exiled from the Garden of Eden. You see that with Israel in the land. And God gave them, you know, the Ten Commandments and, you know, the Book of the Covenant, 613 commandments, uh, and they, they successively break them. Yeah. Generation after generation. Yeah. You know, God sends his prophets, but, but yet they, they disobey, and then they too get exiled from the land. So in both covenants of works, they're exiled. Mm. And, then, and then so Jesus must come under a covenant of works, and then when he succeeds, that new covenant is then uh, imputed to us. Yeah. Just as Adam's sin was imputed to, to us later, but uh, the elect, the believers, uh, Christ imputes his righteousness to them, and he takes our sin, uh, yeah. and he pays for our sins. So, so this all seems very biblical, and, and so, but you're, you're saying it, it, that it you, is. you left Reformed theology, and, and you moved on into a new way of looking at things. So... Well, I mean, and I think this idea that, um, you know, just because one aspect of re Reformed theology is correct, I mean, it makes it all correct. Yeah. And I think this is where I disputed other aspects of it, such as uh, infant baptism, mm. uh, their position on Israel. Uh, I mean, has the church now replaced, uh, you know, the, God's promises to Israel? Has now the church taken over those promises? Yeah. Uh, if I you, used to believe that, yeah. but I don't believe that anymore. You don't. If you if you are a reformed theologian, or you you uh, uh, you know you adhere to the, this these uh, viewpoints, right. you're a covenant theologian. Does that mean uh, essentially you must also believe that um, the church replaced Israel? That Israel is the promises to Israel are no longer valid. Well, I would say most covenant theologians do believe that. Yeah, some do not. Uh, but other people like uh, O. Palmer Robertson, mm -hmm. he wrote a book called The Israel of God. He clearly states that. Yeah. He clearly sa states that, you know, there is no more need for Israel. Is Israel. this, if, if you're a covenant theologian, is this the natural byproduct of covenant theology and reformed theology? Is that the natural byproduct, like infant baptism and these sorts of things? I mean, if you, 
if you kind of understand the concept of the covenant, mm -hmm. then that means that if you have children, uh, and I believe they use that passage in 1 Corinthians 7, where it says that, um, Paul says that the children are holy because the, uh, the, the mother, one of the parents, is a believer. Oh, interesting. And so they take that to say, they're not necessarily saved, mm. but they're part of the covenant community, and therefore you, you put the covenant sign upon them. Mm, baptism. A baptism. Yeah. Correct. And so this was one of the things that dislodged me from Reformed th uh, theology was the fact that I was teaching a class, uh, a summer course, in the Prophets at Reformed Theological Seminary Orlando. Yeah. And one of my former professors from Westminster, Dr. Mark Futado, was the dean there. And so um, he invited me to come down, and so I taught the class. And we were going through the book of Jeremiah and Jeremiah 31, and I proceeded to teach that you know, the text says that they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. And so I was thinking, you know, if that's what the text says, and this is, the, this is what the New Covenant says, then that means that only believers are in the New Covenant. You don't have unbelievers in the New Covenant. And so I, I didn't realize what I was teaching at the time, but uh, in the front row sat David Mathis, who, who is uh, John Piper's executive director for De Desiring God. Yeah. And he said out loud... You're a Baptist. <laughs> and, <laughs> that must have really thrown you off. Yeah, and I said, well, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Reformed Presbyterian. <laughs> and, and then so he, he told me at, uh, after class what the, what the implications were of what I just said. Yeah. And so, he, and so he was saying, well, if only believers are in the New Covenant, then you don't baptize children. Yeah. Because they're not believers. Yeah. And so I was thinking, okay, well, I'm going to have to look into this and... Um, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, I'm going to stay Presbyterian. I'm going to stay Reformed. But, uh, but the Lord wouldn't let me forget it. He would, yeah. he would keep bringing this back up into my, into my mind. And so I did some research, and I came to the conclusion that infant baptism was not biblical, mm. and it was simply a ritual. So the irony was that my son was almost out of infancy and, um, you know, Presbyterian ministers in the PCA are not members of our churches. We're members of our presbyteries. So we're duty-bound by the Westminster Confession of Faith to baptize our infant. And at that point, I couldn't baptize my son because I, was, I became convinced that this was unbiblical. Oh, wow. And so I knew that I had to uh, leave the PCA, which I did. And then because I was academic dean at RTS Atlanta at the time, you know, it's Reformed Theological yeah. Seminary. Yeah, <laughs> that was going to throw a wrench into things. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I knew that my days were numbered there, and I started to send out my resume. And, uh, you know, by God's grace, uh, Paige Patterson and Craig Blazing over at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, they entered me, uh, interviewed me uh, later that spring semester, and I began there in fall. So I didn't miss a day of work. Wow. So I left Reformed Theological Seminary in the spring, and I began Southwestern in the fall. That's awesome. My guest today is Dr. John Yo, and we're talking about his testimony of how he changed his method of interpretation of scriptures, how he essentially decided that he could not agree with Reformed the theology. And this also plays out today. There's a big battle right now in the church over whether the church should be supporting Israel or not. Are the promises to God um, in the Old Testament towards Israel, are they valid for today or are they gone and the church now replaces Israel. So when we come back, we're going to talk about this uh, and the implications for everything that's happening in the church and all over the news uh, today and how we should respond. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Save money by taking good care of your car. Call Conover Tires Wheels and Service in Oceanside. Locally owned and operated since 1991 with all the brands you trust. See their great customer reviews and special offers at ConoverTires.com. Dan and his team are proud to support Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. They even sell affordable, reliable used cars and enclosed trailers. Conover Tires, 2405 Oceanside Boulevard, 760-439-1631. Educate for Life helps you build your life on the rock. 
LG Equipment helps builders build on good soil. Luke Gibson's team at LG Equipment is your local source for grading, demolition, hauling, and more. Learn about their bulk water services from trucks to tankers to towers at rentwatertower.com. Get your questions answered. Call LG Equipment at 619-988-0924. Learn more at lgequipment.com. 619-988-0924. Life insurance is like a parachute. If you don't have it when you need it, it's too late. When your family faces a challenge, you don't want to face liability because you're uninsured or underinsured. Decades of San Diegans have trusted Jim Kelly of Kelly Insurance Agency and Allstate to insure homes, cars, businesses, and lives, no matter where they live throughout California. Your family's needs are always changing. Call to schedule a checkup today. Call Jim Kelly and his team right now, 619-562-9199. Thanks for listening today. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We are local here in San Diego. We're actually on K Praise FM 106.1 in North County every uh, Sunday evening at 10 p.m. You got to be willing to stay up late to listen uh, to our, our uh, radio station. We're also on AM 1210 San Diego, uh, but we're also podcast. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on all kinds of social media. And uh, so you can listen to us pretty much anywhere, anytime you want to. And we have all kinds of amazing interviews with people from all over the world testifying to how Jesus Christ has impacted their life and how God has continued to work through them. And uh, my guest today is Dr. John Yeo, and he is recently uh, a professor at, of Old Testament at Southern California Seminary. If you want an awesome Bible education, check out SoCalSem.edu, SoCalSem.edu, that's S-O-C-A-L-S-E-M dot E-D-U. And uh, you can you can get a really solid biblical uh, uh, education and be able to teach the Bible well and really know what you're talking about, uh, Doctor Yo. I was going to ask you, um, you know, there's been a movement towards a less literal interpretation of Scripture, and you know, some people complain about evangelicals. Or they'll they'll say you guys all interpret the Bible literally, and uh, you know, there's poetry in the Bible, there's metaphors in the Bible. You can't interpret everything literally. And, and how do you respond to somebody who says something like that? Well, I think it's pretty clear that when you're not supposed to take something literal, um, it, it kind of goes into the realm of metaphor or figurative speech. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, all of us read the Bible literally at first because uh, that's our starting point. Yeah. How do you get to, to figurative or metaphorical interpretation? You got to go through the door of literal interpretation. So... Uh, you know, I would, I would just say that the Bible, you know, interpret it literally, and if it makes sense, seek no other sense, mm. lest it leads to nonsense. Yes, yes. Right? <laughs> so, uh, and I think the the scary thing about what's happening t in today's evangelical, particularly Old Testament interpretation, is that people are claiming that this text is this genre, and therefore we don't have to interpret it literally. Uh, and so give me an example. What, what, what do you mean? For example, like, um, you know, someone like Dr. John Walton, uh, he's written many books on Genesis and he'll, he'll say that we don't have to interpret Genesis one in a literal fashion, uh, because you have to read Genesis one in light of its ancient near Eastern milieu. Meaning if you, if you don't know like these Babylonian creation myths, like Enuma Elish mm. or Atrahasis, mm -hmm. then you are misinterpreting the book of Genesis by reading uh, your 20, 21st century worldview into that text. Now, there's some truth to what he's saying there, because we, we do have to understand the Old Testament in its historical setting. However, when Moses told the Israelites when they crossed the Jordan, you know, here I'm, I'm referring to the book of Deuteronomy. Yeah. He was telling them, stay away from their gods, you know, tear down their altars, uh, destroy their Asherah poles. So if he's telling them, beware of these other gods, then why in the world would God be using their creation stories to, to write, you know, uh, Genesis 1? Yeah. So, so, so I think, you know, 
because John Walton, he, he, he actually believes in theistic evolution. Mm. He says that Adam and Eve were not literal people, but they were simply archetypes. So um, this is, and this is exactly kind of what we're seeing within evangelicalism. Yeah. Is that we're seeing more of an openness towards interpreting the Bible uh, away from a, a literal, grammatical, historical yeah. fashion. Now, so I guess my question is, is so when you were coming from that reform background, right, right, and you were coming from, you know, more of a covenant theology, does that tend towards less of a literal interpretation of things like that? I would say yes, because, you know, for example, when I was taking Dr. Meredith Klein's class, uh, I mean, I think he was a wonderful scholar, wonderful theologian. Uh, however, he was the one that brought in what, what's known as the framework view. Yes, framework uh, hypothesis. Right, yeah. framework yeah. hypothesis yeah. for Genesis 1. And so he thought that Genesis 1, because of the genre, here we go again, genre analysis, Yeah. he thought it was semi-poetic. And so, you know, there were frames, and it was evening and morning, Yeah. day one, evening and morning, the second day, so on. Yeah. He took that as poetry. He, he took that as a refrain in a poetic text. And because of that, he said, he claimed, uh, anyway, that Genesis 1 should not be read literally, chronologically. Yeah. So even though it, it said one day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, so on, uh, those really are refrains. And because it's poetic, don't worry about you know the chronology of it or the sequence of it, because they're just pictures of creation. Mm. And so days 1 and uh, 4 go together. Uh, because why? The sun and moon and star rule over the light, created on day one. Yeah. Days two and, two and five go together. You have the, the birds rolling over the sky, which is created on day two, and the, and the fish rolling over the sea, created on day two. And then finally, days three and six go together, where you have the land animals and man. Man is the pinnacle of God's creation that rule over the, the land itself and the vegetation. Yeah. Created on day uh, three. Yeah. So when Klein saw that, uh, he said that these were pictures of creation. Mm. And so he thought that Genesis chapter 2 was really the, the literal, chron chronological, historical sequence. But when you compare Genesis 1 and 2, it seems like the uh, Adam was created first, yeah, and then the animals, and then Eve in Genesis chapter 2. Yeah. And so when he saw that, he said, oh, there's a... There's a, there's a discrepancy there's there. There's a discrepancy. There's yeah. a contradiction yeah. but w with the order of creation. Yeah. And so that's why he said, uh, my framework interpretation works. Mm. And because of that, you don't have to believe that yom, the word, the Hebrew word for day, is a 24-hour period. Yeah. And so uh, I believe that he, he held to the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Uh, but Klein uh, and his junior scholar, Lee Irons, were very clear that they didn't believe in animal ancestry. So they didn't believe in evolution. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So so how would you respond to somebody who says something like that? Because and would you say that in your in the past you would have been more open to that perspective? Oh yeah. Okay. So you were very open to that perspective, but something's changed along the way. Right. And now when you see scripture you go, no. So what what is this big change that's taken place in how you respond to the text versus right. how he responds to the text? Well in my in my dissertation, which has been published, um, Plundering the, the Egyptians, I actually uh, support the framework view mm. and, and Klein's view there. But uh, what happened was, after I started to really learn biblical Hebrew and started to look at the text myself, yeah, uh, and I came across a, a wonderful article by Dr. Andrew Steinman uh, in JETS, Journal of Evangelical Theological Society. And he was trying to explain how the word yom was used, and he said that when you look at day one, Moses is actually telling us evening plus morning equals one day. So the, the, the number there, echad, in the Hebrew is actually a cardinal number, not an ordinal number. So he's saying Moses has given us the formula for what a day is. Oh, it's, it's a period of evening, 12 hours of darkness, plus a period of light, 12 hours of day, equals one day, cardinal number. Now, the days after that one day are ordinal, second day, third day, fourth wow. day. And so he's saying, here's another one of these days. Mm. Here's another one of these days. And so, uh, I mean, clearly when, when he's talking about the creation of the sun, moon, and stars on day four, 
He's saying that these are for signs and for seasons to keep track of years, month, months, and days. Moses knew what a, what a day was. Yeah. And when you look at how the Jews reckon a day, they begin at 6 o'clock at night. So it's a period of evening, a period of morning, one day. Oh, wow. So, so when I saw that, I was thinking, you know, every time where the word yom appears, I mean, there is about three or four different senses of the, of the use of the word yom in Genesis 1 and 2. Yeah. But it's very clear as to what the context is dictating. Yeah. It, it's kind of like 2 Samuel 7, where you have the Hebrew word bayit. And so David says to God, God, I want to build you a bayit. I want to build you a house because I live in a nice bayit. I live in a nice house. Yeah. But then God says, no, you're not going to build me a bayit or a house. I'm going to build you a house. So in the first sense, David is saying, I want to build you a temple because I live in a nice palace. Yeah. But then, Dave, but then God says, no, no, you're a man of bloodshed. Your son will build it for me, but I'm going to build you, David, a dynasty, a house, a house of kings. Oh, wow. And so in that text, we have the word bayi, the word for house, and yet it's used in three different senses. Mm. But we don't say, we don't know what the word bayi means. Yeah. It can mean anything. <laughs> so... Know, so you're saying, in, in essence, context is, is, uh, is king. Is king. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And so would you say that that is the fundamental difference between the way you used to think and right. the way you think now? Yes. Is that it's now you're much more focused on context. Correct. And it's also trying to be as, trying to take the words as literally as possible. Mm. And, and, and within its context. Yes. Not, and, disc not discarding metaphor. No. But only using metaphor when it's appropriate. Right. I mean, when Jesus said, you know, if you have a plank in your own eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'd be alive very long. That's right. <laughs> if you left that plank alone. Yeah. So, I, I mean, clearly that's hyperbole. Yeah. It's, it's metaphorical. Yeah. So, but why is it so funny? Because we were interpreting it literally first, and we know that this is metaphorical. Mm. We know it's hy hyperbole. Interesting. Okay, my guest today is Dr. John Yo. We have one more segment left. This this flew by, but we're going to talk about the impact of a non literal non literal reading of the text. How does that apply to our? How does that affect our lives practically um, speaking on a day to day day basis? How does that change things about the way we live and how we interpret scripture? We'll be right back. Gibson of LG Equipment supports Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. Luke grew up in the construction industry and now serves LG's commercial and residential customers throughout Southern California. Whether you need grading, paving, hauling, demolition, on-site bulk water service, water trucks, tankers, and towers, call LG Equipment at 619-998-0924. Learn more at lgequipment.com. 619-998-0924. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teachings. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. Hi, I'm Marissa Conover, and I would love to help you buy or sell your home. I've worked as a realtor for more than 13 years, and as a San Diego native, my passion and experience will help make your move as peaceful as can be. Call me at 619-251-1577. That's 619-251-1577. Or visit conoverhomes.com. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed the show so far. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. My website's educateforlife.org. I'd love for you to check it out. All kinds of good stuff on there. We've got, uh, I believe, over 100 different radio programs, podcasts now. And I've interviewed uh, physicists and geophysicists and people who have come out of Islam 
Uh, people have uh, come out of uh, Jehovah's Witness. I've had people uh, on the show who talk about um, cosmology and science and the evidence from, for God from science. Uh, all kinds of incredible people from all over the world. It always amazes me how God works through each one of us in a different way in the body of Christ. It's a huge blessing. I am going to be speaking October 13th up at Calvary Chapel Oceanside. Uh, if you can make it out, um, we're going to be talking about the evidence for the age of the earth, both from a theological perspective and also from a scientific perspective. Is there evidence that the, the earth is actually only around 6,000 years old? Uh, that's not something you hear too often, but um, I believe there's pretty compelling evidence that that is the case. And uh, if you want to come out and, and give me a challenge, I'd love to have you come out and uh, just do some exploring with me and have that discussion. My guest today is Dr. John Yo, and we've been talking about specifically how you interpret scripture. And so, uh, Dr. Yo, so we've been addressing, you know, the more literal method where you're taking the text for what it says. And this is really, um, this is the, really the Reformation hermeneutic, mm -hmm. which is the plain meaning of the text is what you go with, right? And then, then there's also what's happening today is people are turning the Bible more and more into a metaphorical. And would you say that that movement is growing, seeing the scriptures as more metaphor than a literal? Well, I don't know that we would say that it was becoming more metaphorical per se, but I think when you look at the various systems of interpretation, such as dispensationalism versus reform theology, um, I mean, I would have to say that when that domino of infant baptism fell, that was that kind of like started a, a kind of like an an investigation on my part as to well, what else. Uh, was not biblical that reform theology taught me uh, at Westminster. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I started looking at my millennial views and I started to say, well, you know, look at Revelation 20. I mean, is, is Jesus the angel that came and bound Satan in, in the abyss for a thousand years? Because this is the way that reform theologians take it. And so they believe that there's not going to be a literal millennium in the future we're in the millennium right now. Yeah. And so Jesus is the angel that binds Satan into the abyss. And um, they use texts like where Jesus said, you know, you're going to bind the strong man and then you can plunder his goods. So the thinking is that Jesus bound Satan on the cross. And then from there, he could then plunder uh, Satan's kingdom and rescue the elect uh, from the clutches of the devil. And so uh, that was kind of like the idea when they were looking at Revelation 20. But the problem, though, with that is they don't interpret it literally, meaning they don't take what the words say and actually understand for, for what it means. Mm. A thousand-year period means a thousand-year period where Jesus will reign. And so there are Old Testament texts that, that talk about that reign, that millennial reign, uh, texts in Isaiah uh, and, and other books related to, you know, like Ezekiel, Zechariah, all those uh, books have millennial texts in them. Yeah. And so when you look at Revelation 20, what I noticed was that there was a clear historical uh, progression in terms of the narrative from Revelation 19 to Revelation 20. And so, uh, I mean, typically when the reformers or the reform people look at the book of Revelation, they see seven recapitulations of Christ's first coming to a second coming. And so Revelation 20 is the seventh one of those recapitulations where they see Jesus' first coming and also his second coming uh, in Revelation 20, all there in Revelation 20. Hmm. And, and so when I saw that there was a clear historical narrative going from Revelation 19 through 20, I said, you can't have a recapitulation and still have a, a continuation of the, of the narrative yeah. from chapter to chapter. Because what I saw was at the end of Revelation 20, it says that Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. At the end of Revelation 19, you have, in the beginning of Revelation 19, you have Jesus coming on the white horse, and you have the host, uh, the heavenly host on white horses as well, and they come and, they, and Jesus judges the earth. Uh, at the end of 19, he takes the Antichrist and the false prophet, and he puts them into the lake of fire. 
Yeah. <laughs> but in Revelation 20, it says after he then takes Satan, remember he's, Satan is allowed to be released from the abyss yeah, uh -huh. and he goes to deceive the, the world. Yeah. Uh, and then they, they come against the city of, of Jerusalem and then God uh, showers fire and brimstone, judges them. Yeah. And then it says that he took Satan and he put him into the abyss where the false prophet and the Antichrist had been cast. Yeah. So this is clearly a linear a linear thing here. It's it's a historical narrative. Yeah, it's a historical narrative. It, it, and so I mean I mean I, I have to be careful here because it is a prof, prophetic uh text in terms of its genre. Yeah. But there is clearly a, a a narrative that is being continued from 19 to 20. And so 20 does not represent its own little structure where you have the first coming of Christ to the last to to, to the second coming of Christ. Yeah. And so uh, this is consistent throughout the text in the sense that, okay, if I'm going to approach this from the, a Reformed theological position, I'm constantly having to essentially ignore large par portions of text and just say, that's not what it means. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so as a result of that, I became a premillennialist, and I became a pre-trib uh, rapture uh, proponent. Yeah. And so um, and it was all because... I started to reread the Bible from a literal, historical, grammatical uh, hermeneutic. Yeah. And using that lens to interpret Scripture, it's really opened my eyes. And um, it was it was kind of scary at first because I didn't know what I believed. I mean, it was like, do so. Okay, I'm not an infant Baptist anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, do I believe in amillennialism? Yeah. Do I still believe in you know even my Calvinism? I, I was. Re-examining that, yeah, and, and so all of that was kind of you know back on the table for me, and uh, whereas I was before that, I was a clearly committed Reformed theologian. Mm. I believed in amillennialism. I used to teach Calvin. Like, would you say that you believe those things more because this is what you had traditionally been taught in your tradition, uh, and not because it's what the Bible actually taught, but it was but just because of what you assumed? That's 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 a very good point, Kevin, because I. Um, when I become reformed, I swallow that, you know, that theology hook, line, and sinker, mm. and uncritically, I, yeah. And I was, I, I was just all in. I, yeah, I just said, you know, what, if I'm going to be reformed, I'm just going to be reformed. Yeah. And some of my favorite theologians, like R.C. Sproul, uh, you know, some of the older ones like John Murray, uh, Meredith Klein, uh, Gerhard Voss, uh, these were kind of my heroes. Yeah. And so if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And, and that was kind of like my uh, my take on things until that day at Reformed Theological Seminary Orlando. Yeah. And that kind of opened my eyes where I was thinking, you know what? If, if my systematic theology doesn't agree with my biblical theology, mm. then something's wrong. Yeah. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. And it's, yeah. it, it can't be my biblical theology. Yeah. It, it has to be my systematic theology mm. because if I see something... Uh, that's biblical, uh, then I can't believe in something that goes against that that belief mm. uh, in terms of my interpretation of Scripture. Yeah. And we were talking briefly a little while ago how, um, you know, Israel's in the news and everything. How How is this playing out as far as the church and its, its uh, treatment of Israel as a nation? Right. So what's interesting is that many Reformed theologians, and I, I mentioned O.P. Robertson, they would say that what happened in 1948 really has no bearing on Israel itself, meaning the, the, the nation that's there right now, uh, it doesn't really matter. It, it, it changes nothing because really God rejected the Jews. And it, it's not that they're not saying that we should, uh, you know, we shouldn't evangelize the Jews, but what they're saying is that you know, it really they, they really hold no more plan. Yeah, it has no no role in prophecy or anything. Right, there's no bearing of uh, the importance of of Israel right now in terms of prophetic fulfillment. Yeah, and so um, you know when I had again kind of looked at the situation from a literal vantage point, and now reinterpreting the prophets from a a dispensational literal hermeneutic mm. uh you know i see israel as not just you know uh being important now in the land and supporting israel yeah uh and 
also being careful. I mean, because when you see some of the churches, you know, there a lot of them are Presbyterian churches. Mm. And and also when you look at the history of the church, uh, particularly the early church fathers, and then even Martin Luther. I mean, this is uh, this is something that really people really don't bring out about Martin Luther Luther's um, his anti-Semitism. Yes, yeah. uh, toward the end of his life. Mm. And uh, I mean, he just got really frustrated with the Jewish people. Yeah. And, and so, um, but what he said was kind of a, it, it was almost setting up what, what happened at Kristallnacht with, with, the, with the Nazis uh, burning down the Jewish businesses mm. and, and things like that. I mean, this is, this is something that, that Luther had fomented. Wow. And, uh, and you, you read some of the early church fathers, they were also anti-Semitic because they were the Christ killers. Uh, and so in our day, when we, when we see, you know, how we treat Israel, how, wh- what do we think about Israel as yeah. a nation? Uh, and do they have a future in God's plan? Yeah. Uh, and will they receive God's blessings and, uh, and the new covenant, uh, Jeremiah 31? Yeah. Uh, this is something that is not just peripheral to the scriptures. This is a main issue. Absolutely. And so to say that the church has replaced Israel in my opinion, that's that's heresy. Yeah, that's, and it, that's that's not biblical. And the real world implications of that it, it, it's not just an ivory tower debate, right? Uh, so what we believe actually makes a difference in in what we do in the world, right? Um, so uh, Doctor Doctor John Yo, um, I just want to thank you so much for being on the program with us today. Well, thank you for having me, Kevin. It's again. been a huge blessing. So I hope your first time on the radio was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so socalsem.edu. Uh, if you guys want to get to know him better, um, he's on the on the website there. He's teaching classes. Uh, that'd be a, a huge blessing for you and anybody else that gets to sit under him. And uh, I want to end with this scripture, 1 Timothy 4.16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Um, what we believe matters. And uh, when our doctrine is off, because we haven't read the Bible to mean what it means, right? Say what you say and mean what you mean. Um, then it does have real world implications. So I encourage you get to know the word of God better and, uh, and take it for what it says. I hope you have a great day and a great weekend and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye. Did you miss part of today's program? Don't worry. We're committed to helping you get the info you need. Okay, that was dumb. But for real, visit educateforlife.com for podcasts and video recordings of the show and to sign up for the School of Unshakable Faith. Leave us your comments, compliments, questions, or concerns at 800-243-9719.